Hey there. So here we are, chapter 13. Um, last chapter, chapter 12. All of these boat acts that come flooding out of that um, out of that room and out of the house, Fungus Man's house, um, and headed out in the street. And then when Odd Thomas went back in to check out the black room, the black room was gone. So that's where we left off. So let's go ahead and get started. Chapter 13. Beyond the threshold lay an ordinary chamber, not infinite in its dimensions as it had seemed earlier, measuring no more than 12 by 14 feet. A single window looked out through, its, through the branches of a lacy melaleuca that screened much of the sunlight. Nevertheless, I could see well enough to determine that no source existed for a sullen red light either in the center of this humble space or in any corner. The mysterious power that had transformed and controlled this room, casting me minutes back and then forward in time, was no longer in evidence. Apparently, this served as Fungus Man's study. A bank of four drawer filing cabinets, an office chair, and a gray metal desk with a laminated imitation wood grain top were the only furnishings. Side by side on the wall opposite the desk hung three black and white poster-sized photographs that appeared to have been printed on a draftsman's digital plotter. They were headshots, portraits of men, one with feverish eyes and a gleeful smile, the other two glowering in the gloom. All three were familiar, but I could at first put a name to only the one with a smile. Charles Manson, the vicious manipulator whose fantasies of revolution and race war had exposed a cancer at the core of the flower power generation and had led to the demise of the age of Aquarius. He had carved a swastika on his forehead. Whoever the other two might be, they didn't have the look of either Vegas comics or famous philosophers. Perhaps my imagination, as much as the Melaleuca filtered sunlight, imparted a faint silverly luminescence to each man's intense gaze. This glow reminded me of the milky radiance that informs the hungry glare of animal corpses in movies about the living dead. In part to alter the quality of those eyes, I switched on the overhead light. The dust and disorder that characterized the rest of the house were not in evidence here. When he crossed this threshold, Fungus Man left his slovenless, slovenliness behind and became a paragon of neatness. The file cabinets proved to contain meticulously kept folders filled with articles clipped from publications and downloaded from the internet. Drawer after drawer contained dossiers on serial killers and mass murderers. The subjects ranged from Victorian England's Jack the Ripper to Osama bin Laden, for whom hell had prepared a special suite of fiery rooms. Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, Charles Whitman, the sniper who killed 16 in Austin, Texas in 1966. John Wayne Gacy, he liked to dress up as a clown at children's parties, had his picture taken at a political event with First Lady Rosalind Carter and buried numerous dismembered bodies in his backyard and under his house. A particularly thick file had been assembled for Ed Gein, who had been the inspiration for both Norman Bates in Psycho and Hannibal Lecter in The Silence of the Lambs. Gein had enjoyed eating soup from a human skull and had fashioned a fancy belt from the nipples of his victims. The unknown dangers of the black room had not daunted me, but here was a known evil, entirely comprehensible. Cabinet by cabinet, my chest tightened with dread and my hands trembled until I slammed shut a file drawer until I slammed shut a file drawer and resolved to open no more of them. Memory freshened by what I'd seen in those folders, I could now put names to the poster-sized photographs that flanked Charles Manson. A photograph of Timothy McVeigh hung to the right of Manson. McVeigh had been convicted and executed for the bombing of a federal building in Oklahoma City, where 168 people were killed in 1995. To the left hung Muhammad Atta, who had flown an airliner into one of the World Trade Center towers, killing thousands. I had seen no evidence that Fungus Man sympathized with the cause of radical Islamis Islamic fascists. As with Manson and McFay, he apparently admired Atta for the terrorists' cruel vision, brutal actions, and accomplishments in the service of evil. This room was less of a study than it was a shrine. Having seen enough, too much, I wanted to get out of the house. I yearned to return to Tire World, breathe the scent of rubber ready for the road, and think about what to do next. Instead, I sat in the office chair. 
I'm not squeamish, but I cringe slightly when I put my hands on the arms of the chair where his hands might have rested. On the desk were a computer, a printer, a brass lamp, and a day calendar, a day date calendar. Not a speck of dust or lint could be seen on any surface. From this perch, I surveyed the study, trying to understand how it could have become the black room and then could have reverted to its ordinary space again. No residual St. Elmo's fire of supernatural energy glimmered along the metal edges of the file cabinets. No otherworldly presences revealed themselves. For a while, this room had been transformed into a portal, a doorway between Pico Mundo and somewhere far stranger, by which I do not mean Los Angeles or even Bakersfield. Perhaps for a while, this house had been a train station between our world and hell, if hell exists. Or if I had reached the bloody red light at the center of that otherwise perfect darkness, perhaps I would have found myself on a planet in a remote arm of the galaxy where Bodax ruled. Lacking a boarding pass, I had instead been flung into the living room in the past, then into the carport in the future. Of course, I examined the possibility that what I had seen could have been mere delusion. I might be as crazy as a laboratory rat that had been fed a diet of psychosis-inducing psychosis toxins and forced to watch TV reality shows that explore in detail the daily lives of washed-up supermodels and aging rock stars. From time to time, I do consider that I might be mad. Like any self-respecting lunatic, however, I am always quick to dismiss any doubts about my sanity. I saw no reason to search the study for a hidden switch that might convert it again to the black room. Logic suggested that the formidable power needed to open that mysterious doorway had been projected not from here but from the other side, wherever that might be. Most likely, Fungus Man was unaware that his sanctum served not merely as a catalog repository for his homicidal fantasies, but also as a terminal admitting Bodax to a holiday of blood. Without my sixth sense, perhaps he could sit here happily working on one of his grisly files and not be conscious of the ominous transformation of the room or of the arriving hordes of demonic entities. From nearby came a tick, 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 a bone-on-bone -bone rattle that brought to mind Halloween images of ambulatory skeletons and then a brief scuttling sound. I rose from the chair and listened, alert. Tickless seconds passed, a rattle-free half-minute. A rat, perhaps, had stirred in the walls or attic, made sick and restless by the heat. I sat once more and opened the desk drawers one by one. In addition to pencils, pens, paper clips, a stapler, scissors, and other mundane items, I found two recent bank statements and a checkbook. All three were addressed to Robert Thomas Robertson at this house in Camp's End. Goodbye, fungus man. Hello, Bob. Bob Robertson didn't have the necessary malevolent ring for the name of a would-be mass murderer. It sounded more like a jovial car salesman. The four-page statement from Bank of America reported upon a savings account two six-month certificates of deposit, a money market account, and a stock trading account. The combined value of all of Robertson's assets at Bank of America amounted to $786,542.10. I scanned the figure three times, certain that I must be misreading the placement of the comma and the decimal point. The four-page statement from Wells Fargo Bank accounting for investments in, a care, in its care showed a combined value of $463,000. $125.43. Robert's handwriting was sloppy, but he faithfully kept a running balance in his checkbook. The current available resources in this account totaled $198,648.21. That a man with liquid assets of nearly $1.5 million should make his home in a shabby, sweltering casita in Camp's Inn seemed downright perverse. If I had this much green at my command, I might continue to cook short order now and then purely for the artistic satisfaction, but never for a living. The tire life might not be in the least, might not in the least appeal to me any longer. Perhaps Robertson required few luxuries because he found all the pleasure he needed in ceaseless bloody fantasies that gouted through his imagination. A sudden frenzied flapping, rattling almost brought me up from the chair again, but then a sharp and repeated shriek identify the source as crows pecking out their turf on the roof. They come out early on summer mornings before the heat is insufferable, spend the afternoon in leafy bowers, and venture out again when the gradually retreating sun begins to lose some of its blistering power. I am not afraid of crows. 
In the checkbook register, I poured back through three months of entries but found only the usual payments to utilities, credit card companies, and the like. The sole oddity was that Robertson had also written a surprising number of checks to cash. During the past month alone, he had withdrawn a total of $32,000 in $2,000 and $4,000 increments. For the past two months, the total reached $58,000. Even with his prodigious appetite, he couldn't eat that much Burke Bailey's ice cream. Evidently, he had expensive tastes, after all. And whatever indulgence he allowed himself, it was one that he couldn't purchase openly with checks or credit cards. Returning the financial statements to the desk drawer, I began to sense that I had stayed too long in this place. I assumed that the engine noise of the Explorer pulling into the carport would alert me to Robertson's return, and that I would be able to slip out of the front as he entered by the side door. If for any reason he parked in the street or came home on foot, however, I might find myself trapped before I discovered that he had arrived. McVeigh, Manson, and Mohammed Atta seemed to watch me. How easily I could imagine that genuine awareness informed the intense eyes in those photographs, and that they glinted now with wicked expectation. Lingering a moment longer, I turned backward through the small, square, day-date pages on the desk calendar, searching for notations of appointments or other reminders that Robertson might have written during recent weeks. All the note lines were blank. I returned to the current date, Tuesday, August 14th, and then flipped forward into the future. The page for August 15th was missing. Nothing had been written in the calendar after that date for as far as I cared to look. Leaving everything as I had found it, I rose from the desk and went to the door. I switched off the overhead light. Golden sunshine, trimmed into flame shapes by the intervening blade-like leaves of the Melaleuca, made a false fire on the sheer curtains without greatly illuminating the room, and the emboldened shadows seemed to gather more heavily around the portraits of the three killers than elsewhere. A thought occurred to me, which happens more often than some people might suppose, and certainly more often than I would prefer whereupon I switched the light on again and went to the bank of file cabinets. In the drawer labeled R, I checked to see if among those dossiers of butchers and lunatics, Fungus Man kept a file on himself. I found one. The tab declared Robertson, Robert Thomas. How convenient it would have been in this, if this folder, folder had contained newspaper clippings concerning unsolved murders as well as highly incriminating items related to those killings. I could have memorized the file, replaced it, and reported my findings to Wyatt Porter. With that information, Chief Porter could have figured a way to entrap Robertson. We could have put the creep behind bars before he had a chance to commit whatever crimes he might be currently contemplating. The file, however, cont contained but a single item, the page that was missing from the desk calendar, Wednesday, August 15th. Robertson had written nothing on the note lines. Apparently, in his mind, the date itself was significant enough to include as the first item in the file. I consulted my wristwatch. In six hours and four minutes, August 14th and August 15th would meet at the midnight divide. And after that, what would happen? Something. Something not good. Returning to the living room, to the stained furniture and the dust and the litter of publications, I was struck once more by the sharp contrast between the well-cleaned and well-ordered study and the rest of the residence. Out here, engrossed sometimes in raunchy magazines and sometimes in romances innocent enough to be read by ministers' wives, evidently oblivious of forgotten banana peels and empty coffee mugs and dirty socks long overdue for laundering, Robertson seemed to be unfocused, adrift. This was a man of half-formed clay, his identity in doubt. By contrast, the Robertson who spent time in the study creating and tending to those hundreds of files, surfing websites dealing with serial killers and mass murderers, knew precisely who he was, or at least who he wished to be.